Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. Sitting to my immediate left, we have Hadley Pratt. Joel Johnson is sitting to your left. Joel, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Doing well. All right. And then Lisa Davidson from The Outsourced Sales Manager. Absolutely. Pitch me Boxy. Okay. So Boxy is an all-in-one desktop fab lab, which sounds very confusing, but I can unpack it for you. It's basically the multi-tool of the future. You can do uh, CNC milling, laser engraving, and 3D printing. The pitch for Boxy is less verbal and more image. Yes. You show what Boxy can do. Instead of doing the very expensive outreaches like conferences and things like that, we pinpoint a few very central events where I can build relationships or we can build relationships Mm -hmm. and we do the face-to-face thing. And what we do is we don't try pitching them. We just engage them in a relationship first. Right. We ask them about their personal needs. We get them talking. And then if there's overlap between their personal needs and things that they they have stated that they want, then we will it, we will engage the conversation of sales. Yeah, there's a version of mentorship that I adore, right? And the reason I, I say I hate mentorship is because it's a strong statement and <laughs> it makes people go, oh, I'm going to listen to this. Even oh, yeah, we're going to use that as the opening <laughs> snippet of the show. <laughs> Apparently, you've learned the way we edit these things. <laughs> go for it. Hey, everybody, welcome back. This is the second of two shows we're doing a recording session we did with the people from Boxy, specifically Hadley Pratt and Joel Johnson. They were good enough to come to the Epicast studios and talk to me about being a startup, selling to schools, what they see as the future of sales. Really interesting stuff here. I really didn't want to cut all of this off and leave it all in the premium bucket. We got a little bit into the academic angles of things, you know, not dehumanizing the prospect or the customer or the client or whatever terminology you like. Hadley and Joel are going to get into that a little bit with us today. Lisa Davidson is still here from the Outsourced Sales Manager. Really glad to have Lisa's feedback. We're going to dig in a little bit deeper. This one's not going to be an extended episode like last week was. This one is the traditional 30-minute standard issue size. I hope you enjoy it. Cinch up your chin straps. Here comes Boxy. Maybe the the feeling that you have about sales terminology is that it tends to dehumanize the other person. And and we're aware that there's a certain aspect of that. Um, we're not trying to dehumanize people when we put them into these boxes and we move it along the way we are. Um, salespeople learn very early that time is the most valuable asset that you possess. Your money comes second and then everything else comes next, right? So in other words, your time... Um, your time savings comes from basically just having an agreed upon dictionary. So like we have prospects and we have customers. And I know that you as my buyer, you're not a prospect, you're Hadley. And I like you and I enjoy talking to you on the phone and and you, you seem to get what it is that we do. And I think you'd be a perfect fit for our little community of buyers, right? I have to go talk to Lisa and she's my sales manager. And she has say 10 different salespeople under her charge and that's literally what she does. It, when, when, when Lisa says the outsource sales manager, that's literally what she does, right? Is she goes in and she does one-on-ones with all the different people that are responsible for sales. And she will not say, tell me about Hadley, that lovely young lady, right? She will say, tell me about the prospects that you're working on right now. Because ultimately, the sales manager is going to be responsible for telling people, especially in production and operations, what to expect, what's coming down the road in, in like – product demand and like, are we going to be able to make rent, you know, on the, on the space and everything in between? Can I, can I respond to that? So, sure. So, um, I was raised in sales. I was raised in sales. My, my, my father ran salespeople, lots of salespeople. My grandmother ran a lot more people. She's an 83 year old CEO, by the way, of multiple companies still. Her. So, <laughs> um, and so I come from a long line of sales. Um, And the language, I think, it's still steeped in a little of the older form of sales. Yes. Where sales was less about alignment and and finding a need that you can actually solve. Yes. And more about pushing your product on people. Agreed. So, like, for instance, I don't refer to the ask as the ask. 
I invite people because if I have to ask them in any way to come to me, then I have done a, I'm not talking to the right person or I've done a really bad job talking to them about their needs. Mm-hmm. So I'll, so if, if I can invite them, that's my version of the ask. And when, when we wouldn't refer to, we would have a different language around prospects, right? right. So internally, we would never use the word prospects mm-hmm. because again, that dehuman, dehumanizes people and the language that dehumanizes people will eventually change the way that your structure and your, and your culture forms in your company. And we would never want to use a dehumanizing language because honestly, it, it would vast, it would cut down on our profit margins because what we're ultimately in the game of is a human experience. Mm-hmm. We're not selling an object. We're selling an experience. And if we are not, if, if our people have gone down the line of accidental culture via the linguistic, the, the more abundant language of old sales, yes, then uh, we will have formed a less enriching experience total. But can I turn the tables for a second? Go nuts. What Joel was saying, I realized I wanted to pick both of your brains as experts in this. How do we maintain this sort of ethos when it comes to sales strategy as we scale up? That's going to be... That's a good question. Almost impossible. Let's be very blunt. It's not going to be impossible. I said almost. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, I, we're really good at doing what's next to impossible. You will get to a point where... You need someone to be in charge of the salespeople, or you need to be someone to be in charge of marketing, or you need someone to do business development in Asia, or right, you're going to have these kinds of problems, right? And you're going to have to make a decision. Do we sit with an empty chair, or do we settle for the person who maybe doesn't 100% align with our culture? There is no litmus test. So culture is less of a very – so culture is a matter of a, a continuum, right? They're more or less on the culture. Um, and so eventually as our infrastructure grows, a lot of those people will only hire people within a certain margin of error for culture, right? And if we're going to have to settle sometimes, right, as we grow bigger and bigger. Especially considering how imprecise the measurement of – Adoption, yes. Yeah. So I, as the CEO of the company, I will never be hands off about sales. It's too, it's too big. So I will always make sure that the hiring for those positions is exactly as I want it. Okay. It, it, within margins of error. Mm-hmm. Lisa, I said it was nearly impossible. What do you think? I totally disagree with you. You disagree. I totally disagree. It's almost like that's why you're here. I'm so sorry to disagree <laughs> no, with Lisa you. No, Lisa and I have two very different perspectives. So we understand we understand what you're saying about, you know, how it, the 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 terminology and it can feel manipulative or contrived or, you know, rather than letting things grow organically and there's a shift. There is a major shift in how people are doing business and they're more if you can get them at the front end with why you can help them, if you can tell stories that resonate with them, they're going to give you an opportunity to, to, to speak differently. So the front end of your process is going to be so important. And I'd like to make the analogy to your manufacturing process. So if the front end of your manufacturing process you don't start with quality materials and you don't make sure that they're refined and that through the whole manufacturing process, there isn't going to be a failure or a gap or an issue. If we follow that and use that kind of model through your, what we want to call sales, whatever you want to call it, through your revenue generating process, you'll, you're going to be successful. Do you see why I knew you were going to be a perfect fit? <laughs> I Thank knew you. it. I know you well enough, right? And these are true believers here, and that's a good thing. Now, here's here's my more skeptical take on it. And and you know where I stand, right? I think the key is going to be keeping lean. I really do. I think you you hire as few people as possible. I think you make it self-service if you can, right? Um you have a few people that you can keep within your your very tight orbit. You don't have a person in Asia. You have a person that literally is down the hallway from you. You do web demos where you can, you do self-fulfillment where you can, but there there will be no substitute to proximity for maintaining culture. So that is 
So we will never give up one thing. So we may give up manufacturing to an outside contractor right. who we have thoroughly vetted. Right. But we will never give up the control of the overall experience. Yep. So um, that, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. It is all about the totality of the experience. I agree with both of you that this is. Uh, that we can never give up that experience. If we do. We will go out of business eventually. I like how committed you are to certain principles, right? And I don't doubt that you sometimes get static about it because you're you're very committed, right? And it comes across very strongly. And I think that you need to be ready to sort of plant your stakes in the ground when you have big dreams. And, and Boxy, I mean, definitely, you've staked out an experience, not a product. You've staked out a high quality, high touch um, differentiator, right? I really like where you're at in terms of being committed. Um, but to, to Hadley's question, the scaling, you're right. You're going to be, you're going to be faced with some choices and I, I'm glad you're at least thinking about it. I mean, those are actually solvable problems when you get to the, you know, that point. I worry though, because I think a lot of people see success as 500 field offices and there's no such thing as a cultural litmus test across 500 field offices. So as long as, you know, as long as you're looking at it both ways, you're committed to a set of principles, but you're also willing to say like, okay, there's certain things, there's a Rubicon we cannot cross because eventually we become a big dumb company instead of a startup. And the person down the line from down the line doesn't really care about our corporate culture. Their brother-in-law needs a job and they're going to hire him. So we kind of interrupted, we, we were talking about, you know, the process that you take people through. We stopped with, with qualification. Hadley, after you qualify somebody, where do you go from there? After I qualify somebody, then I go in to fill in the gaps in the sort of that education thing I was talking about earlier. So if they are someone who's super advanced, then it's all about sort of talking about how Boxy can meet their advanced needs. So I can sort of get really technical if I need to, or I can, uh, I can start talking about the resolution and all the nerdy things that, you know, your normal buyer is not going to care about right. just yet. Um, and if they're not advanced like that, then I go about educating them. And I don't want to educate them in a patronizing way. I want to basically create a buffet for them of information that they have access to. So a lot of times this is emails, um, right. emails or phone calls. And, you know, I keep a store of tutorials, videos, YouTube videos, articles, things that I find helpful as a beginner, as a novice in this world, what has been helpful for me to understand it, then I share it with them. And if they have questions, answer their questions. Um, you kind of have to gauge how much people want to read or how much they want to hear something, you know. When when does the price conversation start? Um, the price conversation usually comes up pretty abruptly in the very middle. Because our price is out there. It doesn't change. You know, I'll extend maybe a discount every once in a while. Um, usually it's because I really got excited about what the person's doing. So yeah. like, for instance, like we had a local, our, our shop's in Homewood and there is a uh, after school program that operates in Homewood and it's right down the street. And I was like, you know, I would give you a huge discount just to see you have one just because right. you're in our neighborhood. It's so awesome. Did you see Lisa and I exchange knowing glances when you said that the price conversation pops up right in the middle? Lisa, tell her. Well, I have, I have a couple thoughts. So you go first and then I'm going to, I'll tag on to you because I'm, I don't want to. They've decided that this is something that someone like them would buy. Amen. That was where I was going. Now they've, they've identified themselves as being a potential buyer of this. And now they need to see whether or not they need to stop themselves from taking mental ownership or continue down the road. Yes. And the other, where the other thing I was going to say is you, you, you kept them going. So you on every cylinder are hitting the, the need, you know, it's, it's the key, like when you do a Google search, the keywords, you're hitting those. So I think that's so key. And it's because if I can circle back, it's because you did the qualification correctly on the front end. So, so you know, you know what's going on, you know what's going to do it, and you know how to pull it through. I like your, I like your uh, comparison to Google search, right? You know, like they're looking for certain keywords and you've used them and you've used them in, in a way that they feel as though, um, 
they might be ready to take the relationship to the next level to go back to the... <laughs> In this this idea going forward, who now starts the conversation about whether or not to to complete a transaction? You or them? Do you wait for them or do you ask them? Um, I usually let them. I'm not. I like I said before. I'm I'm really not a a, a pushy person when it comes to selling. I it makes me really uncomfortable to be honest. Um, but you're not alone in that. I generally find that the people who want to buy the conversation goes in that direction anyway. So it like I said, I just kind of. Just happens organically. I use a um when I'm selling, I'm a little more aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> so I invite in stages. Okay. And so I I will actually like um so when I was running salespeople for our contracting company, what I would do is I always tell them, you get to the door, when you knock on the door, you hold out your hand and you wait for them to shake it. If they don't shake it, you're not gonna get the sale. But if they do shake it, you've gotten one decision from them. And so if I'm, I, if I'm, if I'm talking to the right person, sometimes they're a little apprehensive about buying, even though it will, it it will, it'll make their experience of life better. I will, uh, I'll continually commit them through stages. Joel, I get the feeling like you were brought up maybe in a more manipulative sales process. Am I right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, so my, so my father was a pastor and a, uh, a runner of salespeople, a serial entrepreneur. So um, it wasn't, I value alignment, but I still have some of those, those useful tools. They're not manipulative. They're leadership. Not when I use them. (laughs) You've got, you've got, when you're doing, when you're generally, you see people reject it after they've been raised in it. Right. Um, Yes. When you see, and I don't mean raised from a parental sort of, I mean, you're like typically your early sales managers, uh, shape the way that you do deals for the rest of your career. Right. And when you resent that process, um, typically you make the pendulum swing to the other direction. Yeah. I mean, so you resent when you have empathy and you are a fully constituted human being, you, you, you typically resent the inhuman aspects where you turn a person who is a full emerging human being and you turn them into a mark. I was just going to use the yeah. same word. That's really yeah. funny that you used that word. I would never, never will I ever use a person as a mark. You know where the, what the origin of that word is, right? Okay, so um, when pickpockets and thieves and whatnot wanted to hit uh, like a public place, somebody would, would mark the back of your jacket so that they knew who the suckers were um, that would fall for the con. I, I was always interested in, so the, in the usage of the word, right? Because it is, it's a pretty colorful word. You know, you love to see like the Ocean's Eleven type movies, you know, that explore, you know, like, oh yeah, you gotta, he's an easy mark. Uh, so I was like, okay, well, where's that come from, right? And it's because there's somebody out front who says, okay, this is a trusting person, or this is basically things that we would generally regard as like your very positive Mr. Rogers kind of traits as negative vulnerabilities, Right. And, and I'm, you and I have alignment on this. Um, I guess my journey's taken me in a slightly different direction, just in the sense that I see the sales process as an organization of time. Um, because my job is to take small companies and make them big mm-hmm. or at least as big as they want to be. And, um, I learned the hard way over a lot of repetitions that time is super valuable. Time is honestly, so much more valuable than money that you really can't quantify exactly what the multiplier is. Mm-hmm. So, um, Lisa, the two very different closes there. Yes. And if I, I just, I just had a, a kind of a little aha moment and that is, I loved what you just said and I kind of, maybe we can coin it the golden rule of selling, sell to others as you would be sold to. I love that. Yeah. It's the easiest way to empathize. Mm-hmm. But you're still going to take them, you still have to, they still need to be led because this is your process, not theirs. And there's a way to guide them because if I want to buy something from you, I don't know how. So you still need to have your process so that you don't miss a step so that you can guide them to be successful with your process and your product. And that includes where it finishes. Yes. Where really mm-hmm. is, is when you tell people that you're not going to wheel out any more acts, yeah, right? right? Like 
there's not another demonstration. Like the, we're done now, right? And and I'm, you and I have alignment on this. Um, I guess my journey's taken me in a slightly different direction, just in the sense that I see the sales process as an organization of time, um, because my job is to take small companies and make them big, mm-hmm. or at least as big as they want to be, and. Um, I learned the hard way over a lot of repetitions that time is super valuable. Time is honestly so much more valuable than money that it, you really can't quantify exactly what the multiplier mm-hmm. is. So, um, Lisa, the two very different closes there. Yes. And if I, I just, I just had a, a kind of a little aha moment. Did you? And that is, I loved what you just said. And I kind of, maybe we can coin it the golden rule of selling sell to others as you would be sold to. I love that. Yeah. It's the easiest way to empathize. Mm -hmm. But you're still going to take them, you still have to, they still need to be led because this is your process, not theirs. And there's a way to guide them because if I want to buy something from you, I don't know how. So you still need to have your process so that you don't miss a step so that you can guide them to be successful with your process and your product. And that includes where it finishes. And that's what I think a close really Mm -hmm. is, is when you tell people that you're not going to wheel out any more acts. Yeah, we're done. Like there's not another demonstration. Like we're done now. And a close can be as simple as, have I answered all of your questions or is there still more you'd like to know? Because when you get to that point now, you're saying the show is over, the elephants and the monkeys and the flying circus is over, as opposed to, and, and understand, I when I first got started, I was the king of the soft soap. I used to wait for the person to tell me when they were ready to buy. And when they wouldn't, I would come up with another act. Right? <laughs> like, okay, hang on a second. Okay, I got an elephant and a clown. <laughs> oh, hell. <laughs> we're running out of entertainment here. And what would end up happening is they go, you know what? He came out so strong at first. <laughs> like he was doing <laughs> such a great job. And then he's just kind of fizzled, right? And I realize I've got to tell them when the show's over. I gotta, I gotta flash the lights, I gotta raise, you know, drop the curtains and take take some bows. And that's where I think a close is useful, especially for someone like you who feels it so much more than maybe some other people that you don't want to mislead people, but you still you still want them to know, like, okay, now this is the end of the ride. Yeah, so I like the way that you talked about that in terms of show. So it, a show is all about experience. There is no physical product at the end. You are creating a meaningful experience for someone to carry with them, right? So when you close, it's it's, it's less. So when you talk about close, it's it's kind of discreet. Mm-hmm. But what you're really doing is you're shaping an overall experience yes. and direction, right? Mm-hmm. So it is simply that you've reached the end of the experience. Yes. And I like the way that I like loved your analogy. There's this type of sales training that says, uh, everyone's the same. This is a factory job. Go pull the lever. We both kind of reject it, right? You know, we we understand that there are elements of their analysis that are useful. That is actually so one of the things that I hate about mentorship. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I hate mentorship. Okay. As mentorship. So and, and and I shouldn't say I hate mentors because there are people masquerading have the na- label mentor who are not what I call a mentor. Right? We're back to manipulation. Yeah. So mentors teach you top down, and they use their old world to say what's worked before, mm-hmm. right? And when you are as a startup, especially, and as a, a beginning business, you are really the world's diversity, right? You are the world's version of creativity yes. for the for the world mind, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think sometimes that mentors, because it's a it's a unidirectional process essentially, mm-hmm. they're speaking to you. I like challengers, right? Because they don't destroy your uniqueness. And I think right now, especially more than ever, one of the things that um, that we need more than ever is to facilitate the difference mm-hmm. of our small companies. So right now, there's a way of looking at business that is corporate, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of corporate people right now are trying to mentor startups, but startups have a completely different social way of looking at the world. And it may, in fact, be more profitable on many different levels as far as market sustainability, as far as how you make profits through sustainable copies and things like that. We should be challenging them, finding out how they're getting their customers, finding out what their version of a pitch is. 
and things like that instead of teaching them. And so, um, you're not going to find a bigger cheerleader on this point yeah, than me. You, I seriously think startups are the laboratory where new ideas come from, but I will throw this caveat. They need a big enough microphone to be heard. Yeah. There's a version of mentorship that I adore, right? And the reason I, I say I hate mentorship is because it's a strong statement and <laughs> it makes people go, oh, I'm going to listen to this. Even oh yeah. We're going to use that as the opening <laughs> snippet of the show. <laughs> Apparently you've learned the way we edit these things. <laughs> go for it. But I love mentors. There's the kind of mentors that make you more sophisticated instead of indoctrinated. I, uh, I will say that what I liked about this conversation is I came into it, like I said, when I first approached you, I wanted to talk about how education is such an important part of getting people on board of a product, right? Because now more than ever, we have to be experts on things that we didn't even know existed, right? Um, and, and we're really being pulled in a lot of different directions. Uh, so now you're you're... You're able to buy literally a factory full of equipment for four thousand dollars. Imagine finding out twenty years later that you could have built the product that you had conceived of. Right? There's so much to keep up on. Right? And and I, I I did. I came to you with the idea: How are we going to raise boxy above the noise level? How do you raise boxy above the noise level? And I think we had a completely different conversation. And that's again, I'm I'm really happy for it about the nature of a startup and the personality and principles and values. Hopefully you took a little bit away from our thoughts on, on the sales process for sure. And, and being non-manipulative about it. Uh, that's, it's very important to us. Uh, Lisa and I share a lot of these, these sort of core human values, which is why I like having her on my show and we'll probably ask her to be back again. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, before you go, how would people reach out to Boxy, uh, whether it be through your website, social media, phone numbers, emails, what contact information do you want to put out there? So the number one best way to reach us is to email us. Uh, we all kind of live in our inboxes. Um, so info at Boxy.com. That's B-O-X-Z-Y.com. Do you have a Twitter account or an Instagram account that we can uh, tag to all of the promotion that goes with today's show? Oh yeah. Our, uh, our Instagram is at BoxyCNC. And our Twitter is at Boxy CNC. I, I really enjoyed today's conversation, especially considering that we were experimenting with a new format. This was a little bit live without a net for me with so many people and making sure that everyone got their ideas across. I think we did that pretty well. Well, this was great. Thank was you fun. so much for having us. I did have fun. I had fun. All right. Thanks. Thanks. I'm tired. That was a long one. But I think, I, honestly, that was a lot of fun too. That was so much fun. And I'm so glad we allowed for the time to be able to develop ideas and to be helpful to these guys so that the whole idea of being cookie cutter sales process is hopefully we've obliterated that idea. In the startup space, I think it's real easy to get pushed around by the sales process, because when your company is small, you don't hold as much power, right? And I think that probably develops a certain amount of resentment amongst owners and founders and and the people that work there. You know, when there's only four, six people, and granted, they've grown bigger than that since, but um, there's a lot of different things that make people a little skeptical of formalizing a sales process when they're in a small organization. Well, and I think that's because we've all been burned by that process from past experience of being forced into a, a certain set of questions and a certain way for those questions to be asked. And that whole concept of close should not be sliding the pen across the desk, press hard three copies like we were all taught. It's not that way anymore. It's about, did I hit your needs? Does this seem to fill the problem that you need to solve? And am I and my product the person to do it? Lisa, how do people reach out to you if they want uh, outsourced sales management, as it were? Absolutely. I have an incredible website that one of my clients actually developed for me that I'd love for you to go to see. And it's the outsourcedsalesmanager.com. That does it for this, our very first workshop style show here on the Pitchworks podcast. It was a lot of fun. I'm going to go sleep for a week though. Uh, we put we put the hours in on this one. 
I'll catch you in about seven days. Thanks so much for listening. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart, LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com. E-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S dot com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.